Welcome to this week's lecture in scientific programming in Python. Um, this week is only half a week because on Thursday there's no practice because it's Ascension Day, a public holiday in North Saxony. So we will have only a lecture today and that will be a lecture without homework. And because of that, uh, we don't want any real content in there. So um, next week we're going to handle Matplotlib, but for now I'm just I want to talk about code quality, professional IDEs and debugging because these are the things I think are important but require no real homework. So for this week's homework, you're going to just get um, a few of the tasks I already promised two weeks ago in the um, advanced Python lecture. Okay, uh, you're also going to notice that my Jupyter Lab now looks a bit different. Um, that's because we're going to do debugging here in Jupyter Lab, which is new to me too, and that's a really nice thing. So um, bear with me. Um, we will upgrade it together, I hope. Okay, let's start with code quality. Um, when you're in a programming environment, what people generally mean with code quality is um, sticking to style guides. Um, sticking to style guides is really important, yes, um, but it's also not everything and not everything that makes up code quality. Code quality, for example, is also, especially in Python, idiomatic programming and using language features and the nice ways of where the language helps you. Which is why, for example, there's this Zen of Python. If you import this the first time, it's going to show you this Zen of Python. It's actually a Python enhancement proposal too. And this is what Python wants to be and how Python wants its program as to code. Beautiful is better than ugly, explicit is better than implicit, etc., etc. So we've seen some of these already. Flat is better than nested, for example. We're making generators that generate over nested lists to make, in the end, when we're using it, to have something flat. Um, of course, Python also sometimes breaks this. So for example, there should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. Um, sometimes there's not. We see the basically this comprehensions and um, reduce and map basically do the same thing. Um, but generally, there's um, this is how Python wants it to code. Guido van Wassen, the guy who invented Python is Dutch. But yeah, so stick to, so these are principles Python wants to stick, stick to, and this is how Python wants you to code. However, this of course doesn't tell you really much, um, but you're going to get better at coding and I'm showing you real quick um, stuff how we may get better at coding. So, first of all, yes, um, there is this style guide I've already explained, PEP 8, the Python enhancement proposal number 8, which is about a style guide for writing Python code, okay? So, this is really useful. It's really useful to do follow style guides because if you're working with more than you on a project or if, you, like, you, you, if you're looking at other people's code, you want to understand it. And how do you understand their code but yet they form it in the same way as you do and please don't make other people follow your style but follow the one style everybody's following already and this is pep8 so we've already seen this so this is for example how you're supposed to name modules and packages classes have in contrast to the other self camel case instead of snake case etc etc global constants are always all caps and so on um, spacing, you're supposed to indent using four spaces, except Google, which break it and use two spaces, which sucks, thanks Google. You're supposed to use spaces over tabs. We broke this, for example, in the last homework, or in the penultimate homework, where we use tabs accidentally, um, but generally we should use spaces. Line length, this is the one I'm constantly working. Officially, according to PEP8, um, you're supposed to use 79 characters, however, this is really not much. So it, it is supposed to be small, because, for example, if you're making a more complicated git diff, you're having both of the files side by side. And if you're having two files side by side, even on a wider screen, 90 characters is already quite quite a lot. You still want to be able to see without having font size five, uh, you, you want to be able to see both sides. So make short lines. I'm really not often doing this myself as we're gonna see in a second, um, but you should do it. 79 is really, really not much, especially having indentation of four spaces. So 90-ish is fine, up to 100 is fine. So, but please never more than 100. Um, if you're using string or double quotes, it's not important, but once you've decided to stick to that, comments only when needed. This is actually what Python wants you to do. 
I don't know what you learned in AUD, but Python really wants you to use comments sparingly, only where the code does not explain itself. Okay, so this here is the official Python enhancement proposal, um, where it tells you the really long version. There are also shorter versions. Um, for example, here at pep8.org explains it a bit better with more examples. You can use either of those. Okay, and generally what's also a good idea, try to keep the git diff low. What do I mean by this? So for example, if you're having, oops, if you're having a list, a equals one, two, three, four, then well, if you're having only numbers, of course, this makes sense, but if these were longer, what you wanted to do is you wanted, you want, for example, to be the comma on the same side, so, such that if you remove one of these and actually even the parentheses here, on a new line. Because now if I remove either of the elements from the list, I'm only removing the one row. However, if I had the commas on the next line, like this instead, if I wanted to remove um, the one, now I would have to change this line too because I would have to remove this comma. So this is for example, um, this is one of the hints how you know what a better style is. The style that keeps the git diff low. So if you if we remove one element, we only want to change one line. We want to change only one line as often as possible. So that's what I mean by this. Okay, and speaking about now the style guide, there are so-called things as they are linters. Okay, and linters run over source code and analyze it for programming languages as well as coding standards. These exist and these are actually quite useful and they're used in bigger environments too. So for example, what uh, many programming companies do that they have, they don't allow you to git commit. So it's possible to make a, a pre-commit pre hook in git, which is a program that runs every time when you want to do a git commit and forbids you to commit if you don't stick to the style guide and you can't commit then. That's I don't like it too much, um, but actually it's really not a bad thing. And what these linters will also do, they will also tell you um, about where you could improve your code, where you could make something, I don't know if you're using, if you're, if you're using concepts wrong or something, um, linters are also able to show you this. So as an example, so this here is simply running the sample solution for the polynomial. Um, you should have already seen this, uh, the homework from two weeks ago. So this is the content of this. And now, for example, there's the linter pylint, and this is what pylint, so it simply you run it on the terminal, so we could just as well have opened a new terminal here. You see, I updated my Jupyter. So here, and that would show me the same thing. But this does it well, it tells me all of the errors that pay, where I don't stick to pair and I didn't stick to pair weight for quite some time. So here I had two spaces, I really had a trading white space, etc, etc, some line too long, some lines too long, of course. It's a missing doc string, of course. And this even weights my code here. Um, there's pylint, there's also, for example, flake8, which is really rigid and strict about um, pep8, and we don't follow this. But what these do here, I see, um, so these here have a W at the beginning. So they show me warning, they show me errors, and they show me more. So W is warning, um, E is error. And if you're looking at the documentation of either of those, um, you're gonna see you, you can uh, make them only tell you errors. So now, for example, I can run pilot with minus minus disable, and then I'm disabling these two kinds. Uh, I, I'm not sure what these kinds mean, but then I'm only sticking with this really important, basically error. I mean, it's not making the code not one, but it's really bad to access a protected member here of a client class. So this is something I really should never do. I even didn't, didn't see so far that it didn't work. So having these linters is good to make your code quality better if you're having bigger projects. Okay, so, but like I said, what they're also gonna show you is a lot of pep aid enhancements and style enhancements. And what you can do to um, stick to these automatically is you can fix all these errors in yourself or you could try an uncompromising formatter like black. Like black. What black does is it simply reformats your code 
to stick to the Black Woods, which are a strict subset of the Pepe Woods. They're even worse. So you see, you could seed your own coding style for a consistent one, and every time after you code it, you could run black on your code and let black reformat it for you. And if everybody in your project does it, you're all following black style. And that's actually really, really good because this is a good style, which makes sense to uh, follow for everybody. So now once we did that, we're looking at this, we see that, for example, this here, this used to be one line. And actually, even though I love one-liners, one-liners are really bad style. And this now made this one-liner a lot better as we see here. So I kind of disagree with some of the decisions here, like having this line like this. But again, it's a consistent style. If everybody uses this style, that's really what it's supposed to be. So before you make your own coding style, actually, so if you didn't code Python for long, and I don't know, a few years, may even, may even not be long, could still decide to seed your coding style and follow black style. And now once I ran black on it and I go for flake 8, except having this error, okay, it tells me it returned non-zero exit status because I have errors in here. So what this flake 8 also does, like I said, you're using it for pre commit hooks and then it returns zero, which means everything was fine if there are no errors in there, and one if there are errors in there. And because I'm still having um, a few lines too long, because black has uh, is standardly set for like 90 lines instead of 90-ish lines. Like I said, instead of the uh, 79 lines for flag 8, this would still be wrong. However, so I'm even still ignoring two warnings here. So I could also make the line length better. Wait a sec. So it must be like this. So now if I tell flag 8 that a line length of 100 is fine and to ignore these two warnings, which are um, well, I shouldn't decide to a lambda expression. Ah, yeah, like I said, I love one-liners, but I shouldn't do here. So this is the only error I'm having here. But if I ignore this, then now my flake 8 runs fine. And now even my boss will be fine with my code. Okay, so this is how you make code for the style guides. And like I said, PyLint and so flake 8, not that much, but PyLint really also tells you um, where you could improve your code, for example. And you can get it like this. So you have to install it like this. Okay, now, like I told you already, following style guides is one thing, but writing good code is not code that follows style guides. So I recently stumbled on a really nice example that perfectly shows how legible Python code is in comparison to boilerplate languages like C++ or Java. So boilerplate means copying the same code many times over and over. And in Java, you do this a lot because for every class variable you have, you have to write getters and setters. And you don't have to do this in Python. And that's why Python is better. Okay, and this is from a really nice talk, which I've also linked below, um, right here, where he explains, where he says, well, looking at only the style guide, and if it follows the style guide, is one thing, but good code is not, like, if you focus on the style guide, you're not focusing on good code. And I want you to focus on good code. Okay, so let's have a look at this example here. So let me move this first. Now let's look at this example here. So you don't need to know this is some random library which doesn't exist. You don't need to know this except that it's obviously a ported Java library. Okay, so automatically translated Java library to Python. And what this code does here, well, it uses this library to get some network element at some IP. And then it wants to get some routing table from this. Does error handling. And then it gets from this routing table, tries to get well, all the routes and then loops over these routes and then gets the name and the IP address and then prints this. So what this does here, it, it prints all addresses and names from some routing table from some network element at some IP. Okay, this is all you need to know and cleans up afterwards. Is this code kept payback compiled? Yes, because I made it. So linters wouldn't bother. Does this code work? Yes. I mean, these libraries, I have, I don't have them because I don't want to use it. I don't, I just want to show you. So this code would work, yes. However, is this code Pythonic? And is this code beautiful? The answer to both is no, because this code is shitty because it's Java code. 
The same code in Pythonic and also in Beautiful is this. And this is good, beautiful code. And it does the same thing as before. So with network elements, so we're having a context manager here and we're taking this network element as any, and then we loop with a Python style for each loop over the routing table of this and then simply print root.name and root.ip address. This does the very same thing, except it's short and beautiful and better code. So does this pass the way? Yes, it does. Does this code work? Well, not yet, because this is not how this library here works. Is this code Pythonic? Yes. And is this code beautiful? Well, compare to this and tell me. Okay, how do we do this? Well, in this case, and this is what the talk, for example, also talks about is we have to have the adapter pattern. So the adapter basically um, allows the interface and this is of an existing class to be used in another interface. So this class here has a shitty interface. We have to have dot access really many times and this dot access is not a honking great idea. We have to make, uh, we have to use these getters. We have to get the size and then loop over the range. This is what we're doing in Java. And then we have getters again. And Java is not beautiful code. Python is beautiful code. And we can make this non-beautiful interface to beautiful interface using Python. And what we do here is we're using all the concepts we met two weeks ago. What we're doing here is we're making, we're using object orientation, we're making custom exceptions, we're using context managers, the property decorators, iterators, and Python style for loops, okay? So first of all, we, for example, replacing this shitty um, exception with a good one. It simply says network element error. And we can make new exceptions in Python using two lines. And then we make our own class network element. This has a constructor. And for example, this routing table now is a property. So we can simply call this network element dot routing table. And what we're doing here is we're raising the except we're raising. So if we get this shitty exception, we're raising a good exception, which also explains what the error is, which the original one didn't do. And then we're also making our network element a context manager such that we can call this with syntax. And what's really nice about this is that the cleanup, which is happening here, we can simply make in this, in this context manager. So context managers also have this exception type. So if there's an exception type raised inside this, um, the exit of the context manager is going to get the exception here as argument to the exit dumda method. And then we're simply logging the exception, we're cleaning up, and we're cleaning up otherwise anyway. And then we disconnect, which is what we're doing here. But now we don't have to do this in our boilerplate code. And every time when we want to use the our network element, we can simply write these three lines of code instead of, well, for example, well, this again, and also this stuff here. So we're having this lines plus this lines all in this one context manager line. And then we're also never doing like get root by index or get routing table or get name or get IP address. In Python, we can simply make these attributes. So we have self.ip address and we can simply call network element.ip address. Why can we do this? Well, in Java, we have to use the scatters because if we would ever change the behavior of our function um, and we don't have a getter, then we can't change it because people are already accessing the um, the underlying variable. And if we want to change like the variable, um, how the variable is got or how it's, how it's set, we cannot do this anymore. However, in Python, we can simply make our add property and our getter afterwards, which looks the same as, for example, this. So this routing table is also a property. So this even has the error handling inside this, but it's still, we don't need a getter. We can simply behave as if this was actually an attribute and it's really nice. Okay, and then our routing table, we're making an iterable. And as I explained to you in the practice two weeks ago, something is an iterable as soon as it has a len and a get item method, which um, raises an index error if we're accessing something which is not accessible anymore. So instead of having to get here the size and then looping over the range and then looping over the range and then getting these by index, what we're simply doing is by making this an iterator using get item and len, and then we can simply loop over it like this, which is much more beautiful, again, as these three lines of code, because it's only one. 
And then instead of using the get name and get IP address, we can again use our properties here. And this is fine in Python. So we changed these three lines again, search these three lines for this one line. And this is beautiful idiomatic Pythonic code. Okay, so if you want the longer version of this, watch this talk. It's a really good talk um, where he uses the exact same example and the code is taken from this. And the last thing to improve your code quality I want to show you are these code cutters. And this is something I really like and I really do myself. Um, and this is one of the many actually, to be honest, websites where you can train programming and train to write good code. So you're giving challenges like this. So this is an example challenge you're getting there. Your job is to write a function which increments a string, blah, blah, blah. So for example, foo becomes foo1, foo bar 23 becomes foo bar 24. And if they're leading zeros, they're supposed to be there. And if there's no number, it's supposed to be one. And you have to solve them. And then you solve them and then you can look at the solution of others, either sorted by be best practice or most clever. So most clever are the cool one-liners which use language features you've never seen before and bit shifts and all that stuff. They are cool and nice to see and nice to learn something about the language, but the best practice is what you're supposed to use in big code because, well, it's maintainable and you see what's actually happening and it's still fast and so on. So this is really, really nice. And um, here's another example. So you are given an array with at least length three containing integers. The array is entirely either odd, big except one even, or the other way around, and you're supposed to find this one outlier. Okay, and when I wrote this method, for example, it took me like six lines or something, which was rather long because, well, you can also make it like this. And this is one of the, I think this is more sorted by most clever. It's not the best practice because it's still hardly maintainable and you don't understand it too much, but it's a really good solution. And they're just one, some of these cutters here. So this is the original one I had. And then you can simply look for the solutions. And then you see here best practice, balance of performance, readability and maintainability. And these are some solutions. So they are obviously of different length. And then if you go for clever, like I said, this is where you're going to see the binary bit shifts and the stuff you've never seen before. Not for this one, but hey, there's also one liner with a lambda function, of course. And so yeah, you're going to find one liners for everything, which is probably not the best practice. And they're really cool um, coding tasks. And this also really, I didn't do too many, but this really helped my coding too, because this is where you see good solutions and best practices for coding problems. And you're also battling the others and approving yourself, etc.